365 cut. These are the meaningless ramblings of a Scottish weed on whore and a pissy ex-video store clerk. Their ongoing mission is to set right the movie wrongs. They're gonna need a bigger podcast. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 60 of the 365 Flicks podcast, uh, another indie talk episode as you can see by the label on the title of the episode. That's what so it says on the tin? It, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Episode 60 though? Episode 60, That's that's. I do feel like we're jumping ahead. I do, I do feel like this, we're, like we're, we're kind of flamming this one, we're faking the funk on this one. But we're not. Because normally in episode 60 we'd be, we'd be having a bit of a celebration. Which it is a celebration episode because it's a great episode, but yeah, we're recording it ahead of time. We're like the doctor. Should should I have pulled back the curtain on that one or should no, I have you, left you that? shouldn't at all. You've ruined it. You've ruined the whole illusion for oh, the listeners. Okay, well let, let's just um, let's go back. Hello, everybody. Welcome <laughs> to episode sixty of the Three Six Five Flicks podcast. Another indie talk. A fantastic, fantastic indie talk. One that you've been waiting to do for a long time, and I have edited the conversation so far. So yeah. It sounds fucking great, and you're all going to enjoy it. So, why would you would you like to tell the good people, Chris, what we're talking about tonight and who we have on? Yes. So, on this episode of Indie Talk, we are joined by Andrea and Roberto Molinari. Yeah, I got the name right. Woohoo! You did. You did. Who wrote the Shepherd? Which, if we remember a few episodes back, I uh, raved about this uh, this graphic novel. It's rightly fantastic. so. Right, rightly so. Kev, you've you've, listened, well, you've uh, not yet. listened to it. That's <laughs> you have read it as well. I have read it. I like to point out I'm still sober. Yeah, um, and it's only like four o'clock in the afternoon, which we never ever. That's record. what it is. That's what it is. It's yeah. like we're we're on daylight hours right now. Yeah, I've normally had a power nap and then yeah, come up to n- record. Norm- so normally uh, we're twilight hours when we record. So the, the uh, this episode is uh, all about the shepherd, which we love. Uh, if, if you. Remember from the from the other episode that uh, the shepherd is about a normal family, a normal guy whose son dies in tragic circumstances. It's got yeah. a sort of theolo- theological aspect to it. Uh, the the family is torn apart by the death of the son, and so the the father uh, Lawrence takes drastic steps mm-hmm. because he has the feeling that his son is his son's sort of soul is not at peace and he's tr- the, the the son is trying to make contact with him so he takes drastic steps to try and make make sure that his son is okay yeah. and then and then skip to the end shenanigans shenanigans <laughs> you're just calling shenanigans right now are you <laughs> It's a great story, fantastic, uh, fantastic novel. I couldn't stop reading it. I think you were the same. Didn't you read yeah, it all in one I, night? I read it all in one night. I didn't I, quite I, do I, that. I went for it. I just went full bore. It was one of those stories that once you actually started reading it, as as the guys will tell you, like there's so many emotional points that just rip you straight in and just 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 hit you, absolutely hit you. And that's why I couldn't put it. You know what I'm like when I'm watching stuff like that and it pulls me in emotionally. I, I can't put it down. So I couldn't, and I, I went right through to the end, and I can't wait to see what these guys do next with, with this book. Well, yeah, as as they will say yeah. shortly, uh, there are more issues coming your way. Yeah. And have a look for The Shepherd on Amazon, and uh, Andrea tells everybody yeah, they where pimp- you can find it. They can, we're not great at pimping things They were out. better than us. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, they, they do a lot of this pimping, so, you know, the big pimping gets it going, so... We're just not very good at it. However, we can pimp ourselves. We can do. So, where can people find us? Oh, well, I'm doing it. Yeah, you can. Wow, do it. you can do it. Damn, I'm going to screw it up completely. You, you, now. you did well last time. Did I? I think so. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you can find us on Facebook and you can find us on Twitter. Just have a look for Three Six Five Flicks Podcast. You can have a look for our website, which is shiny and awesome. Three Six Five Flicks Podcast dot co dot uk and all. <laughs> No, no, that's right, that's right. And all, all the links for um, for The Shepherd that we can get our grubby little hands on to, for you to go and buy this book, they will all be on the website, they'll all be in the show notes, so just click them and go and buy them. Uh, we don't get anything for it, but, you know, that's fine. Unless there's an Amazon link, and then we will. We'll get, like, a pence. Ooh. A tenth of a pence, I think it was. I can get my pony. <laughs> 
You can also have a look for us on iTunes and you can have a look for us on Stitcher and Satchel and all your third party podcast apps on the Androids. Uh, we are also on some networks, are we not? Yeah, we're on some uh, fantastic networks. We are on the Tangent Bowl Network with Mark, who has got plans for world domination with his audio technology mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, more about that to come. We are on the Wicked Radio Network with Big Sexy Dev and his Big Sexy Hands. We are on the the Nerdly, the, the nerdly.co.uk, our British home, because every British podcast needs a British home. It does. Which I've not said for a while. Nope. We're on Weeby Geeks, which is the same place you can find all of our buddies. I mean, you can find everybody that we know on all these different sites and all these different networks, but... Weeby Geeks is a place where, where most of the people that I listen to are, are also on, much like Tangent Bound and Wicked Radio and uh, everywhere else. Mm. And if you want to if you want to find a cheeky little amazing podcast on, if, if you've just got some spare time and you're like, I need a new podcast in my life, hashtag pod and family on the Twitter and you will find many, many, many on there. I literally just found a new one a couple of days ago. It is an audio drama Ooh. I'm getting into my audio drama. I'm Damn. Kind of, I'm kind of feeling like we could go down that road. Oh, no. Yeah, we could, oh, no, we no. could be all acting and thespian-y. I, no. I said thespian, not lesbian, so... I got that, get, that's fine. I could, get your head out the you, gutter. You, <laughs> you enunciated well. Oh, I enunciated well, did yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ew, I'm going for a cheese baguette. <laughs> Ew. So, yeah. Like. So that's all the places that you can find us. We're, we're everywhere. As Chris likes to say, we are like shit in a field. Yes, we are. We should get that on a t-shirt. Well... I would buy that t-shirt. Well, you would buy that one, would you? I would probably buy that one. Even the one that I asked you to make specifically for me, I would probably buy that one first. There's like 100,000 t-shirts on there already. We've not bought a fucking one of them. <laughs> oh, by the way, we have a shop. Yeah, we have a shop. <laughs> Which, if you go onto the Facebook page, you will find the link to the shop. Yep. There are lots of designs on there. Mm-hmm. More to come. More to come, why not? As you get your little witty one-liners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they all seem to be yours, so, you know... The oranges. The oranges, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, the the interview coming up is with Andrea and Roberto Molinari. You're going to absolutely love listening to these guys. They were so interesting. Uh, who would have thought you could just make an, a, a balls-out amazing comic book from A Nightmare? Mm-hmm. You know, which which they will tell us all about. And I was just as excited to hear about that as, as Roberto was when he first heard about it. <laughs> so, are we just going to go straight into this? Yeah. We'll go into the interview already in progress. Did you get your uh, beers in? I got it. I'm I'm sitting here drinking Sam Adams uh, Winter Lager tonight. It's a good one. <laughs> we just drink fish water, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that. I feel like that. Like straight up can't be true. Like all of the British beers that I've like ever tried have actually been good. Like I was talking about it to uh, some friends earlier about how like the average beer like in uh, in the UK has just got to be like strictly better than what we've got here, which is really hard to say. But I don't know. I think that goes without saying. To be fair, but I'll be a still poor. Hello guys, we are joined by the writers of The Shepherds, Uh, you heard me talk about that a few episodes ago, so we are joined by writers Andrea and Roberto Molinari, welcome to 365 Flicks Podcast, guys, how are you doing? Very well. Pretty good. Excellent. Father and son duo writing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. You don't get that very often, do you? Yeah, not really. Well, I don't know, It's, it's the first I've seen of it. Yeah. But so how do you find that then working together when you're writing the writing the comic or the graphic novel? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of back and forth between us. Like we're almost in constant communication talking about the shepherd. Like uh, we, it's actually brought us a lot closer, honestly. Yeah. Like just constantly having something that we're both working on and uh, working towards. Very much so. I I couldn't agree more. I think uh, I would recommend every father should write something with their son. It's uh, it's been a great bonding experience for us. Very good. I, I did read before. Uh, I read the you know you've got the sort of biography section on it. Uh, now, Rebe- uh, Roberto, the the whole the whole idea of the shepherd came from a nightmare that your that your dad had. Is that right? So mm-hmm. you thought you thought it was cool as hell, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, when he told me about it, like, I guess he expected me to, uh, you know, be kind of horrified by it and whatever. But like, obviously, like, I was just like, that's actually kind of cool, and then. 
basically uh, the nagging process be- like began. <laughs> yeah, I did like that. I did like that in, in the biography section. So, what was it then? What What was the one thing about the nightmare that you thought, "Holy shit, that's going to make such a great story"? <sighs> hmm. Like, I don't know if it was like gen- like just one thing that kind of like stood out to me. Like, it just kind of like seemed to me like it needed like i don't know like it's been really weird for me because like since the beginning i kind of felt like it had to be done and then like once we got it done i was like 100 percent sure like i was positive that we would get published and then like now that we've been published i'm like positive that success will come to us it's just a matter of time like I don't, it's been really uh it's been really kind of like an inevitability for me like a lot of the stuff involving the book and the story yeah so it's like, a and that, I good. couldn't be further from that. From that, that was the exact opposite <laughs> of my feeling from the very beginning <laughs> with this thing. I mean, it's, you know, I, I told him about the nightmare um, with a lot of fear and trepidation because I was, you know, wondering, am I, you know, is this kind of portent? I mean, am I, you know, doomed to, you know, have this kind of prophetic insight of what's going to happen and destroy my family and you know, blow everything up. I mean, it's not, you know, not a very uh, uh, encouraging uh, nightmare. I mean, uh, by any stretch of imagination. So when I told him, I, I certainly didn't expect the reaction that he, that he had. You yeah. Know? And, and as much as he's been, you know, he's absolutely right. He's, he's always had this sense of inevitability with this, that it's never going to be if this occurs, but it's always going to be simply when. Yeah. Yeah. But I, you know, maybe this is because, he's a lot younger uh, than I am. And I have lived a lot longer and I, I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I think this is a really long shot. This is a, a very, very long shot that this kind of thing is going to happen. And, but he was determined. I mean, he really, you know, he uses the word that he nagged me and yeah, I mean, he pestered me uh, just, <laughs> just relentlessly. And um, you know, it was, he was, I'm trying to think now there was probably a good, I don't know, two or three years between when the nightmare actually took place and when I wrote the story with him. Uh, you know, finally the opportunity came. It was June of 2011, and I, I had been working as an academic administrator, as you can imagine. You know, I have academic writing and articles, and I'm working with students and all the administrative burden and, you know, 70 hours a week, and I, you know, I had no time for this kind of thing. And then in June of 2011, there was kind of a window, just kind of the eye of the hurricane, and he got wind of it. I must have mentioned it to my <laughs> wife or something that, you know, I had a little bit of downtime on my hands. What will I do with this? And and he, I think he overheard it, and he just swooped in. I mean, he's like, oh, now this is your opportunity. You, you have nothing on your plate. You said it yourself, you know. Uh, and I think more than anything, just to get him off my back, I thought, oh, okay, sure. Okay, we'll sit down, you know. <laughs> We'll write this out, you know, it, it'll, you'll get it out of your system, we'll all move on, and we'll all be happier for it. But, um, well, first of all, the story just flowed out like water. It just, it was, it was really easy to write. And, uh, and then when it, when it was done, I, uh, you know, I thought that we were done with it. And, uh, no, he was determined that this was going to be, you know, a graphic novel. And, um, of course, I knew very little about how that would actually take place i had done um previous to this i had written a novel historical novel that i had hired an artist to do illustrations for that work uh, about 30 33 individual pieces like one page illustrations for the novel um, but that was the extent of my experience with you know mixing uh art and story and that was prose uh, mm-hmm. so this is a very different you know when you're talking about sequential art it's a whole nother whole nother thing and uh so we you know i really didn't know what to do and he just said oh we got to look on the internet uh, surely there'll be a company out there that we can get help and you know and sure enough we found a company out of sacramento california it's called scattered comic studios and they're kind of a a boutique where you can actually go in and pick out they have an entire a uh, an entire stable of artists that you can choose from and find somebody that will fit the style that you think or the mood that is right for the work that you're going to do. And then a colorist and you, you know, put together your entire art team. And then they serve as kind of your project manager as the go between, you know, between the, you as the writer and, and, you know, the, your creative team. And uh, that's how we produce the, uh, 
the first volume of the Shepherd that you that you had that chance to read. Sure. Well, the artwork is great, though. It is great. Thank it you. Is. Thank you very much. Uh, Ryan Showers is our artist for the first volume, and uh, Ryan's a young man. He's very talented. Um, he actually has a lot of different skills. Uh, he is a costume designer, cosplay uh, costume designer. Uh, designs all the you know the objects and the you know props and things that go along with the costumes and. Uh, he's also involved with the rock band. He lives in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, very interesting young man and uh, extremely talented. You mentioned that Roberto was um, completely all in on making it a graphic novel. Uh, Roberto, what was it that, that made you think that this needed to be graphic novel form? What was the determination behind that? I mean, well, we'd always like read comic books. So... Uh, that was kind of, uh, like, it made sense that way. Not to mention, like, it seemed the kind of story that had to be visual. Like, uh, like, what, like after you've read it, like, you can tell me if you think that I'm wrong uh, after this, but, like, I think that <laughs> the graphic novel format uh, would, like, work, like, works really well for this and would translate well into a movie as well. It would definitely trans- well, <laughs> translate into a movie. That was, uh, that was one thing I said to Kev after I finished reading it. That would make a cracking movie. I mean, my, my thing, my thing with the, the graphic novels. Um, I, I do read a lot of comic books, so I do re- read week to week, as in like or month to month, as it goes, with like your Walking Dead and all that. But this, I quite honestly feel like if we had been sent one issue, I, I would have been like, what on earth? Like, so it it works amazing as a graphic novel. I have, I have to say myself, because I got to like just rattle through it, which it helps. It really helps. Yeah, I don't think it would work uh, as individual comics uh, no. because it creates a mood. I think uh, one thing that is very important with the story is that it, it creates emotions uh, in you. And I think for that to really pay off uh, is that it needs to f- needs to be read almost in a sitting or near to a sitting. So in other words, you really do not want to have a situation where you have a month in between you know, uh, parts of this story. I think it would really disconnect uh, the emotional component of it. And I think, you know, that emotion, uh, you know, we can tell for your listeners the basics of the of the story, at least how it begins. Uh, in my nightmare, I had dreamed that my son, uh, Roberto, uh, who I've always been very close to, uh, I had dreamed that he had gone to a party, tried methamphetamine for the first time, and it killed him. And I was overcome with grief, just, you know, just absolutely devastated. And, uh, you know, in the midst of that, I dreamed that this, this dream was like nothing I've ever had before in my life or since. The best way I could describe it is imagine being strapped into a roller coaster and you hate roller coasters. Okay. (laughs) And you are in this roller coaster and you're forced to take this ride, this horrific ride. And you're going to ride it to the end, no matter what. And so this this nightmare, this dream, was the entire story that you read there. Um, and so this experience of you know losing my son, and not just losing him, but then experiencing the funeral and the the time after that, trying to cope with the grief, and then just feeling myself losing it, just feeling like I just couldn't cope anymore with this loss. And then in the midst of that feeling like somehow he was calling out to me from the other side that something's gone really, really sideways and he he couldn't somehow transition. And then this desire in my heart to go after him, to find him, to, you know, to give up my life and go after him um, and determination to do it uh, just without hesitation, just to do it. And, um, you know, and then all the things that occur, I won't go into those, but uh, all the things that occur in that novel that take place in the nightmare. And, uh, you know, I mean, I I remember waking up, you know, in a cold sweat, my heart beating out of my chest. I literally, it was one of those situations where I woke myself up out of the dream, but at the end of the dream, you know, um, it's as if the roller coaster ride had kind of ground to a halt and then I'm, I'm propelled uh, out of it you know, and in back into my life. And now what do I do with this? What do I do with this, you know, experience that I've had, this horrible experience? And like I said, I, I shared it with uh, with my son. Of course, before that, I shared it with my wife and she hated me. She said, I hate you. Why would you, why would you tell me this, you know? <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, I, you know, I needed to tell somebody, you know, I was, this is really terrible. I don't know what to, what to think of this, you know? And then for Roberto to have just such a, you know, diametrically opposed uh, reaction 
uh, really, you know, it, it kind of forced me to look at the story in a little bit different way. So, so what did your wife say when, when you said, I'm putting it to paper? Well, um, it's interesting. She's really gone through a real kind of evolution of feelings about it. I, it really shook her. I, just to put this in perspective, my wife is a social worker. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, so, can you imagine, like, the how many lectures Roberto got? You know, after this, uh, <laughs> and she has done a lot of drug and alcohol counseling, and you know, just all kinds of, you know, basically the whole gamut of of work in that field. And so, Roberto really became, you know, the the focus of a lot of her attention with regard to, you know, preventative <laughs> uh, lectures. You know, <laughs> and poor kid. Um, but, uh, you know, it shook her. I mean, she, um, you know, he's our oldest son, our oldest child, and, and uh, the thought of losing him was neither of us could, could cope with that. And, um, you know, but as time went on and she saw us working together, I think she really appreciated it. And then when she read it, uh, she cried. Um, and every time, she says every time she reads it, she cries. But she told me uh, not long ago, she said, you know, it's interesting that this thing started out as a nightmare and now I can see how much it's brought our family together because it's really served as something that's kind of bonded all of us together. We've all shared uh, in this process of the story um, and not just now this particular story, but, you know, uh, Roberto and I are working on the sequel to that story, um, which we hope to publish uh, in the fall of this year. Uh, we're doing the page by page art. The story is long since written. Um, but we're doing, you know, the fun process of the page by page, panel by panel, which is, if you're not familiar with it, basically I would compare it to trench warfare in World War I. Uh, it feels about probably as, that you're making as much progress sometimes. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's uh, you know, it's, it's a real process, um, you know, because you're, you're literally seeing this unfold one panel at a time so so you you're talking about um like the the emotions that you you have gone through and all that as, as you've been writing this and, and making this happen but as you say you grew stronger together what was it like for for you roberto kind of I don't, I don't know how to quite word this one but it's sort of like this is a story of, of a nightmare that your dad had about you and then you're right. putting it to paper and i know you you thought it sounded cool and all that but what was the sort of the emotion going on in your head while writing it? Hmm. I know it's only a night. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the thing is, like, I uh, kind of haven't been preoccupied with the whole concept of death, like, since uh, I think it was, like, around 17 that I kind of made my peace with it. Like, just, like, the idea that someday I would die. Uh, like, I kind of had, you know, accepted it from then on, like, uh, unless there's, like, an immediate threat, I don't really worry about it, like, at all. Yeah. Um, so, like, the whole uh, writing it stuff, and it, like, for the uh, for the first one, I was more of, like, uh, like a heavy editor. I was, like, a parrot on his shoulder kind of thing. I was, like, the, the Robin, really. And in a lot of ways, you know, a lot of it has to do with how we view the series. So, I, I, if I were to give you the, like, kind of uh, a simple way of thinking about it, uh, you know, the famous Dante Alighieri, uh, his work called The Divine Comedy, it actually has three parts. Uh, the three parts, of course, the Inferno is the most famous then you have the Paradiso, and then the Purgatorio. And in a lot of ways, I would say, for you to understand the Shepherd series, is that we are the Purgatorio. We are, that's what the theme is, is Purgatory. Mm -hmm. It's this middle ground, and we deal with souls that have unresolved issues from this life, and we hope that we can help them take the next steps to move along in their process. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily providing them with a pat answer or a, a quick fix or anything like that. Um, but, you know, it's kind of the sense of journeying with them, being with them and, you know, hearing their story, uh, offering them some guidance, some companionship um, and helping them, you know, in, in ways that are subtle and not so subtle, so, so to speak. Sure. Well, it does... The, the, I mean, the, the first part, or you know, the first uh, novel, very much does take that that journey, doesn't it? Where it starts off as a vengeance, and then it becomes sort of a morality tale like, towards like the a, end of the healing, story, a healing process. Yeah, kind of thing. very much so. So, so was that important? How important was that for you to you know to, to take that journey to to uh, was that I mean was that linked to your nightmare as well? Where it became yes, part it, of the it, healing it, process of it. 
It was uh, because I, I think in my the midst of this, I had all this anger, but I knew that the anger that I had wasn't solving anything. It wasn't fixing the problem. It wasn't bringing me any closer to finding my son. And, uh, and we actually had and, a huge uh, ongoing debate about that for the longest <laughs> yeah, time, about that. whether or not uh, basically the shepherd would kill. Uh, or if, or if not the shepherd, then, you know, the companion, like basically, uh, that was something that I think that was probably like a literal months long debate, uh, yes. like us going back and forth on that, like, you know, whether or not like the shepherd was, would kill was a huge, huge deal, uh, between the two of us. Like I was in favor, uh, of the shepherd killing for a long time. And then dad finally brought me around to his way of thinking, not because I thought that he was necessarily correct morally, but because of the implications that it would have of a spirit, you know, running around killing a bunch of people. So it's how, do, how, does, I, he, how does he come back from that? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And and also that whole idea of of uh, you know this the process of restoring a soul it doesn't fit into that sense of uh, of a purgatory of a process you know to really explore that process of you know what happens to a person uh, you know in terms of as their soul. Uh, their soul journeys in the afterlife does it you know it's it's i don't i guess my view of of uh the afterlife is that i don't kind of there being necessarily quick fix uh thing where it's you know it's resolved you know there's nothing about our lives as as human beings that makes me think that things are going to necessarily be easy if there is another life on the other side of this you know uh that it seems to me that it's highly likely that that will be you know that will challenge us. It doesn't mean that it's bad, but it, I, I suspect that it, if there is another life, that it, it's going to it's going to demand something of us, and it's going to make us look at things in ways that we may not always want to look at them. Well, I mean, it's it's a great story. It really is a fantastic story. And you know, as I said to you, I, I uh, emailed you the day after I finished reading it, saying that while I was reading it I didn't you know I was reading it in bed before you know before I went to sleep and while I was reading it I didn't want to go to sleep I didn't want to stop reading it I was which, I was the same when I read it to be honest I was like I just need to get through this it, it was just, uh, <laughs> but it was just it was so good and it was so compelling even after the first issue you know the, the, the end of the first part of the story it was so compelling and that's been so long since uh, since any any story, yeah. prose or graphic novel, has, has done that to me. So that's that's just a massive, a massive props to you guys for that. Thank you, thank you. That means a lot. It really does. I'm, I'll be very excited to see what you think of the uh, the next story that we're doing uh, because I honestly believe that this next story is head and shoulders above what we did in the first one. Wow. I mean, ultimately, that's what we that's what we want to do is we want to constantly be improving uh, our our storytelling. Uh, I will give you a glimpse of what. Is, is coming is that was going to be my next question <laughs> <laughs> yeah the uh the next story arc is called the shepherd the path of souls and uh this story's evolution actually is uh connected again to my family my my wife's current work as a social worker is she works for the um, <coughs> veterans administration here in the united states and basically she does a lot of work with soldiers returning from Afghanistan and Iraq Mm. dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are lots of them, a lot of them. And, uh, you know, we've been at war for so long. And even before this latest round, you know, since the 9-11, you know, we, of course, we were, you know, in, in Desert Storm. And, you know, it just seems like we're constantly fighting somewhere. I don't know what it is about us that we seem to find places to fight um but we we seem to do that and um so i'm hearing my wife talking about this every day and talking about you know the therapy and the treatment that is going on and i started thinking to myself you know you have these soldiers that are in combat situations they come back with post-traumatic stress but i started thinking to myself well what if a soldier fell in combat would their soul suffer post-traumatic stress in the afterlife Hmm. And I thought about that for a second. I was like, oh, yes, we're going to be exploring that one, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, so I imagined an, I, an area within the seam, and it serves as kind of a hospital of su- as such for souls that are suffering from post-traumatic stress. And this is a place where soldiers from all different time periods and cultures gather while they're healing, so to speak. Uh, and so in this reality... 
when these souls are with each other, they see each other as part of their original reality. So in other words, if we were all together in a room and, uh, you know, I was a Viking, for example, when I looked at you, I would see you as Vikings, but you conversely would look at me and maybe you're, you know, a World War II German, um, you know, Panzer Grenadier, and, uh, you know, maybe another is a Zulu warrior and the third, uh, the fourth is a samurai. And each of us see each other in, you know, everyone else is part of my context, you know? Yeah, yeah. So in other words, when I look out, I see only my context. Um, and what we're battling, constantly battling, is all the fears and anxieties related to our deaths uh, that are incidents uh, that are related to our deaths are being projected out and are coming back at us. And so even though we might have been enemies in life, we're actually fighting side by side against these, our own fears and anxieties that are coming back at us. As, imagine them as like constructs uh, that are coming back at us. And so what we do in this story is we're telling the story of four different uh, soldiers, um, and we've we picked a, uh, we have our, our oldest one, so to speak, is a, uh, a Wendat Huron uh, native. Um, Huron is what the white man called them. They called themselves Wendat, and they were from modern-day Ontario, Canada, would have been basically where they would have, would have lived. And this particular warrior... Uh, was killed fighting the Iroquois, which were their bitter enemies um, in the late 1640s. Um, we have a uh, Napoleonic soldier who was part of Napoleon's invasion of Egypt and Palestine in 1798-99. Uh, he died at, uh, shortly after the Battle of Jaffa in March 1799. Uh, we have a Confederate soldier, part of the United States um, Civil War, uh, who died at the Battle of Fredericksburg in December December 11th, 1862, and then the final one is a U.S. Marine who died at the Battle of Fallujah in November 2004. Mm. And those are the four stories that we're telling. Wow, that sounds really cool. So basically yeah. you don't have to rely on nightmares and dreams then. <laughs> <laughs> no. Like I said, I, I don't think we could because I never had anything like that before or yeah. since, so yeah. I, I don't think there would be a sequel if we did. <laughs> so, yeah. You have to start eating a hell of a lot of cheese before bed to, to yeah, keep, exactly. keep the story you know, going. Bad, bad decisions with what you're drinking and mixing things that probably shouldn't be mixed and that sort of thing. And then you'll <laughs> get plenty of ideas. I, I know. I know. We keep um, we keep mentioning about the fact that this this started off as as a nightmare and stuff. But it's so interesting that you would take something like that and just build it into something like just so as, as good as this, you know, and again doing it with with your son as well it's just great but so i do feel like i'm hopping on or we are hopping on about the nightmare section but it's kind of like it's just like when chris said to me on the first episode when he reviewed it when he gave it the quick review and he says oh yeah it, it all came from the guy's nightmare and i was kind of like shut up you know <laughs> like <laughs> no and, but then when I read it, I was kind of like, nobody has this nightmare. But it's it's fantastic to actually hear you tell it the way you tell it, and it's and it is it's it, as Roberto says, it's a fantastic story to tell. So well, thank you. It, it, it like I said, it I've never had anything like it before or since. Um, I you know I it's kind of a unique experience. And um, I I would be exactly the same. I'd I'd be telling you to put it to paper as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> So what what was the pro what was the process like then of so you guys have been speaking and Roberta's been pestering you like hell right we've got to write this we've got to write this we've got to write this so what was the process what how, what did you do first what was the process of getting it from holy shit I've had this dream to the the first draft of 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 the story well like I said we literally just sat down at the computer and Roberto was kind of standing over my shoulder through to it. Uh, and just started writing it out, um, you know, I think what I had as an advantage is that I had done a lot of writing projects. They'd all been scholarly, and I'd done one novel before that, so I had I had a good sense of what it was going to take um, and the commitment level that you're going to have to show up at that computer, you know, and keep pounding on this thing until sure. it's done. But, um, you know, the fortunate part about it is that, um, you know, having read so many graphic novels, uh, and reading comic books since I was a child, um, you know, I had a sense of how stories are told in that in that genre. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that that makes it necessarily easier to do, but um, the, I think a lot of it, too, was that the story was so powerful and so ingrained in me that it made it easy to tell it. 
uh, and it just kind of flowed out. Um, so I, I think, you know, as weird as this is going to sound, is that the writing part of it really was quite easy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I wish that all my writing was that easy, but this particular case, it just seemed to flow out very easily. And, uh, you know, the first draft is um, very like what you what you read. I mean, there's changes, obviously. You know, there's always changes. Bear, that was one of the rude awakenings that, uh, Roberto uh, got out of this whole experience is he had no idea what was coming in terms of the number of times that we'd have to read this. Uh, you know, yeah, the book. editing process was uh, that was <laughs> that was just a thing. Like that was uh, like yeah. You keep Let's just say I have no desire to read that book ever again in, in my entire <laughs> life. But uh, thinking I that just, done I, we and published that, like, it, I, I don't. Not. You know. I'm sure that there's errors that are still in there that I, you know, may have missed. I, I don't care. I, I don't want to look at that manuscript <laughs> again. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was really getting that first draft was was very, like I said, relatively easy to do. Um, we, I, I think, we were helped because we went, you know, in terms of getting how do you create a a comic book or graphic novel script. We went to the Dark Horse Comics um, website, and they actually had a prototype that you could download <laughs> and oh. use it as a model. And that really helped a lot about how you would prepare a script, how you break it up into panels, and then you kind of have you know di- directions for your artists. Uh, and I'm, I'm really big on providing directions for the artist as well as lots of references. Um, and I had recently, this is going to sound like name dropping, but it just just so happens it turned out this way. I actually was at a convention that there was a, uh, here in Florida that was pretty small and rather quiet. There was kind of a quiet period and, and uh, Chuck Dixon was there. And uh, he's always been kind of a hero of mine. And so I had a chance to actually talk with him, like, talk with him about the idea of providing references for your artist uh, picture references of this is you know i don't want any gun i want this gun i don't want any hat i want this hat uh this is what i envision the building looking like um you know that kind of thing and it made me feel good to hear him say oh i have an entire you know um uh, filing cabinet full of reference photos uh that i've given to my artists over the years so it made me feel good that uh you know, that I wasn't the only one yeah, thinking it wasn't that just way. You, but it, yeah. <laughs> right. But it made sense to me that, you know, if you're going to ask an artist, uh, why, you know, make them guess when you could help them and say, this is exactly what I have in mind. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, you can't um, take that idea and kind of riff off of it, so to speak. You can't uh, adjust it or be creative. I don't want to. The last thing you want to do with your artist is to strangle their creativity. You definitely want to give them as much freedom as possible. But what I've found is the artists I've worked with seem to really appreciate it. It seems to speed up their process, their work process, by me just saying, hey, this is kind of what I have in mind. And then knowing that I'm giving them creative freedom, that if they, you know, if they feel moved to go in a particular direction, that I'm not putting chains on them, but rather trying to give them some assistance. Sure. Well, it's better doing it that way than they draw something and then come back and you go, no, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. Right. Because that negative kind of interaction with them after a while, it just wears on them and it takes away their energy. And that's the last thing you want because, you know, a lot of people don't realize just how much work the artists put in, um, you know, every one of those panels, you know, uh, and then even the design of how the page will flow. Uh, from panel to panel, uh, there's an awful lot of work that goes into that, and and I just think anything you can do to uh, make that interaction between writer and artist as positive as possible is is really a plus. Sure, uh, because you're going to have a lot of interaction, and you want to make sure that it stays as positive. In fact, one of the kind of policies that Roberto and I follow is the idea that you know unless it's an egregious thing that we feel like we absolutely have to change we don't we don't change it you know we allow the artist to have as you know the maximum creative freedom um and the only time we're going to intervene is if it's an area where we feel like we have to um you know for the for the integrity of the story so and that's worked well i think it, ha- it has worked. i mean the as we said before, uh, you know the, the the artwork in the uh, in the novel is great. It's got a very distinctive look. 
the you know the, the artwork looks fantastic so it's, how it's extremely fit into the story exactly exactly yes yeah. so, so when you were you said you, you went into the onto the uh, the website to look at different styles of art and what have you how did you come to choose that specific type you know that specific artist or that specific type of of look for the book sure um you uh, may go ahead barrel well we uh you know this like for the first one we were going through that uh that website you know uh, scattered comic studios to basically pick an artist uh and we were kind of looking at what they had and we came down to basically two artists uh kyle or sorry not kyle we had uh ryan showers the guy who did the artwork for you know the original shepherd story arc and then the other one was... Uh, Josh Barker. Uh, Josh Barker, right. Yes. Josh is actually the guy that we chose first. Like, we ended up choosing Josh's artwork first because it was darker, uh, and that's kind of what we wanted for the story. Yeah. Uh, and then, basically, we got about an issue in, and he had to drop out for, uh, you know, personal reasons. So we ended up, uh, you know, switching back to Ryan, uh, or switching to Ryan, not back to Ryan, but to Ryan, uh, Ryan took over and then, you know, basically just did an outstanding job. He ended up redoing the first issue. So uh, basically, Josh had a situation with his his children's health that he had to attend to. I mean, it was, you know, I supported his decision completely. I mean, there was it was absolutely the correct decision to make. I mean, you have to put your family first. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, but then. It, from the beginning, as Roberto was saying, is we had two artists that we really liked. And what we saw in Ryan and what we liked about Ryan is, and, and tell me if, if I'm correct on this, I think Ryan really is good at conveying emotion. Uh, the emotional kind of, uh, uh, the poignant part of the story is really his forte. Um, now Josh, we really felt had a dark edge to him. And you can, if you take a look at the book itself in the back of the book, we actually include examples of yeah. art, some of the pages from the first issue that, that Josh did. And you can see it's a much, his inking style is very heavy and intense and it would have been a very dark, you know, uh, nightmarish, uh, character to it, which, you know, of course is why we, we chose it because we felt it was very faithful to the, to the feel of the nightmare. Um, but at the same time, from the very beginning, we loved Ryan's ability to convey, uh, the pain and the emotion, uh, that was part of this, because ultimately you're dealing with a family that has taken the worst kind of, of loss that any family can take. Um, and in fact, you might find this intriguing. This was actually, uh, we were interviewed on another podcast called Geekish Cast, uh, and the, the gentleman who interviewed his name is Jeremy Vilner, Vilmer, excuse me. Uh, he actually shared with us that he had lost his son to a drug overdose. And here he is, you know, reading this book and just saying, um, you know, how it impacted him having actually gone through this in real life. And, um, you know, he said that there were a couple times where he actually had to stop reading because it, you know, kind of uh, overwhelmed him on an emotional level, wow. you know. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that was really an intense uh, conversation that we had um you know, but what, what was really, I guess, gratifying was he said that, you know, how accurately we had uh, connected with the actual emotions that he felt and all the emotions, uh, the whole range of emotions that the, the father figure goes through, um, you know, in the context of that story from the, you know, the, the when you lose somebody in such a dramatic fashion, the first thing you do is you start, you know, second guessing everything that you've ever done, you know. Uh, and then, and as a, as a father, um, I was listening, by the way, uh, I think it's, uh, if I correct me on this, Kev, you have a couple girls, right? Yeah, I've got three, three daughters. Yeah. Three. God bless you for that. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I was listening to one of your podcasts where the girls were on oh, the podcast man. and that was very cute. It was very beautiful. It's, but, the, the, um, the great you know, thing, as a, the, the funny thing, ahead. the funny thing about that is that you, you're saying like working with them working with your son writing this this book and getting this story out uh, how close it was and it, how amazing it was that that little thing um that i did with the girls it's literally only like 10 15 minutes it's one of my actual favorite things that we've done on the podcast absolutely yeah. absolutely and it came across it really did you know um you know, that experience uh of being a parent like that and and having uh you know, those strong emotions that uh, are brought out in you. You know, there's that whole range of emotion that that's possible uh, with, 
you know, you find parts of yourself that you didn't think existed, Mm. um, you know, and that's, I think that's, that's part of it. But, you know, one of the things I want to point out in the story, the character goes through this whole second guessing process where he's looking at his career and saying, you know, I spent all this time on my career and maybe I should have spent more time with my children. And, you know, I'm sure every father and every mother, you know, goes through this experience because, you know, obviously you have to earn a living. You have to go to work because you have to take care of the the kids i mean and so how are you going to do that you have to earn earn a living but yet at the same time in the process of earning a living you're spending time a lot of time away from the ones that you're doing the work you know yeah on their behalf you know i mean it's i can it's it's a terrible catch-22 i can completely relate to that yeah one of the things i I did i did want to say though is um you're saying about the the art and obviously the the other podcast that you were on I can't completely 100% echo the the sentiment because I've never that's never happened to me, so I can't completely think it. But when when I was sitting reading the story, you're right. The art is completely like gets you, pulls you straight in. Ryan Showers has done a fantastic job for you guys, but that I don't want to take anything away from the actual dialogue that you've written because there was there was moments that it fully pulled me straight in. So I just wanted to echo that sentiment from from the the other host of the other podcast. Obvi- Thank you. Obviously, it hit him in a in a deeper place than it would have myself. But my God, the the writing and the art it just goes superbly well together. And I just wanted to echo that. Thank you. That really means everything. Uh, that's that's why you're doing the writing. I mean, is you know you writing is a very I think Roberto will agree to this is a very lonely activity to do because you pour out your heart onto the page and you have to, if it's going to be any good, you have to do that. Um, but you do it and there's like no response. Like imagine going to the deepest, darkest place you possibly Mm -hmm. can go and you pour it out. And then there's just, you know, crickets chirping, you know, there's (laughs) no response at all. And, and it's like, you just don't know if other people will be able to resonate with that experience. And, uh, you know, um, what's been really beautiful and gratifying through this is, is seeing, um, you know, how people have responded to it. And you know, what's kind of interesting since this is, uh, you know, an English podcast, the, um, the reviews that we've had from the reviewers in England seem to have really been, it's resonated very well. And I, that makes me very happy. I know this is going to sound kind of funny, but I'm a huge fan of you know the the uh, television programming that I that we get to expose to uh, from the BBC and from some of the other uh, channels, uh, I just think the storytelling that you have is head and shoulders above what we get out of our television programs. And I'm a huge fan of just a number of of the shows, uh, you know, that I've, like Luther, for example. Um, uh, you know, Happy Valley is another one that I just was blown away by. That I can guarantee you, that show would never have made it in the United States simply because <laughs> you know your actress is not, you know, she's not a supermodel. She's like as far away from that as possible. Yeah. But it was just a powerful, powerful drama, and she was amazing. She was an amazing actress. Um, and I just think that the attention to character development and storytelling uh, in the United States, if we can't blow something up and do it naked, <laughs> you know, I mean, and, I, you know, I, and by the way, I'm not against nakedness in general uh, or blowing things up when the context is appropriate. But uh, we just do way too much, of it, way too much. of it, And uh, I think all too often we uh, think that that's going to somehow make up for uh, pretty shoddy storytelling. So I. I, I'm really happy, you know, that we've our story has resonated, you know, in a place that I think that is known for some very good storytelling. Very good storytelling. I think th- this is exactly the story that us Brits would love anyway, because we're we're a dark twisted people. So. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, a show that I really enjoyed on the BBC. Uh, it's called I think it was called Afterlife. It's with Andrew Lincoln yes. you know, from the yeah, that Walking was great. Dead. That was great. And I really, really enjoyed that show. I was kind of surprised. The one thing that is so different is like uh, you guys I've noticed you you put out television shows and you do a season and it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And they're like, Well, that's enough. It's like six episodes and that's <laughs> it. You know, like in the United States we'd be like, There'll be twenty seasons of that, you know, and we'll <laughs> run it into the ground. 12 seasons after it's run into the ground, we're still going with it, you know, because it was great when it started kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but you guys... No, we should start marketing time, in Russia. You 
so, some really great shows. So one one of the things I I did want to. I mean, just just sort of like touch on a little bit is the the Caliber Comics. Uh, that that's who is putting the comic book out. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So w- once you guys have got your story written, I'm assuming you then get your artist. And then then the whole thing's done. How do you then go to someone like Caliber Comics and how do you sell the Shepherd to them? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help but laugh on that one. Uh, Gerald, do you want to handle this, uh, or do you want me to tell him? Um, you start, and then I'll back you up. All, all right. <laughs> well, first of all, it was an absolute nightmare. Uh, it, it, I can tell you this right now. And again, this was a situation where Roberto had perfect confidence. You know, yeah. um, you know the irony of this thing is here you you know you can be a great writer and you write you know the write this prose or you write the graphic novel, but now. None of that matters because the only chance you have with the publisher is you have to write a great cover letter, which apparently right. I'm very bad at. <laughs> okay, I just want to—I just want to say that right out front is that apparently my cover letter writing skills are quite bad. Uh, we ended up, I, and I am not exaggerating. We sent to sent the the Shepherd uh, manuscript out to over forty publishers. Including, by the way, uh, Blackheart Press, which is a Scottish press. Ah, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, fr- I can't remember friends where they're based. Uh, yeah, I sent it to them, and they rejected me, uh, <gasps> just like everyone else. We, we, we uh, will be send <laughs> as soon as we get off this call. We will be sending an email to yeah, them. Yeah, you're the guy who turned <laughs> down Harry Potter. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, well, it it was you know it was pretty frustrating and kind of scary to be honest with you. Um, but uh, we actually, of those over 40 that we sent out, we actually had about three or four, maybe five, that actually responded to us. And what they said, uh, the ones that did you know, respond to us, kind of pointed to our lettering as being the weak spot in the book. And uh, finally, after that, I said to Roberto, you know, we're hearing, the only thing we're hearing is it, that is negative here is with the lettering. I said, Let's reletter this thing. Let's reletter it. And and while we're doing it, since we're relettering, why don't we talk? We'll hire a professional editor who will read through it and see if there's anything that we can do to tweak the story. Since we're doing the lettering anyway, we might as well, you know, look at the manuscript and say, can we improve the manuscript in any way? So we hired a professional uh, editor to read through it. He made some suggestions, which we uh, put into practice, and then we had the book relettered, and we sent it out then. And uh, that would have been in December of 14. Within two or three days, we heard back from Caliber. They were one of the books, one of the companies that we sent it to. And two or three days after we sent the first issue to them, they they responded to us and said, hey, can you send us the rest of, of the book? We did. And two days after that, they sent us a contract. And um, we had actually sent it to Caliber in the, in the summer of the same year. And they had blown us off completely. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and uh, so we found out later uh, from our publisher that really, in a lot of ways, when we when you send out a manuscript to these companies, it's not that they're really rejecting you. For the most part, they never get around to looking at what you send in. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and he was very honest. He said, look, this is one of a hundred things that I have to do. And what I do is every once in a while, I might have 15 minutes to page through a little bit of this and, you know, and that's it. That's all I have, you know, to look at. And there's a whole stack of these submissions. Um, and that really, you know, that was an eye opener, uh, it, you know, to, to know that most of these small presses uh, do not have a designated editor who reads through these submissions. You know, so in other words, people get to it when they get to it, if they get to it. <laughs> and uh, that was, like, as I said, was an eye opener. So I basically told our publisher, I said, look, I have a Ph.D. in literature. Uh, you know, send me these submissions. I will <laughs> read every single one of them and I will evaluate it. And I will tell you, you know, what I think of the story, the art, the lettering, and I'll make a recommendation. And then you decide what you want to do with my recommendation. And so now I'm doing, you know, precisely that for Caliber is taking, you know, they they send me, you know, books to to look at. And in fact, I just looked at a book uh, this last week from Australia. And uh, man, I really hope we get it. I told him, I said, I I, I read through it was like six issues of this this book. I can't say the name yet, but um, I I, at the end of the first issue, I knew that I was going to recommend it. And I read through the first three and I said I wrote to him, I said, you need to nail this guy down immediately. You need to go get this book 
and get it right now uh, because it's that good. And um, and I said, yeah, I could have told you this after the first issue, but I was too busy reading issues two and three, and now I'm going to go read <laughs> four to six uh, because it's that good. And um, so that's something I guess I would share with your readers. Anybody who is you know thinking of doing this is to understand that uh, you have to have thick skin when you send out to publishers. Um, you're going to get a lot of rejection, a lot of rejection, um, but you have to just believe in what you're doing listen to any critique that you do get any critique that you do get and and really ask yourself you know how valid is this can like in our case we looked at our lettering and we compared it to some of the other books and we thought yeah yeah this lettering could be better and so you know we bit the bullet bullet and uh and had the the book completely relettered you yeah. know and it and as a result we ended up getting not just the one offer, but we ended up with three or four uh, publishers that, that gave us offers on the book. So just something so. as simple as that? Something as simple as, something as, simple yeah. as that. Wow. Lettering, trust me when I say this, lettering is something that's the last thing that, that the creators think about. In fact, all too often you have this where you have an artist who also letters. Um, I can tell you this right now. I do not want an artist who also letters to letter my book. I want somebody who that's what they do. That's all they do is letter. And, <laughs> and I'm sure I'm irritating or annoying. There are people out there that I, I'm, I'm upsetting. But from my experience, I would rather pay the extra money for somebody who that's all they do is letter, you know, and get the best quality lettering. And I'll pay more for it, too. Um, I'm willing to do that because I, I've come to realize, you know, the letterer, what, what you don't realize about the letterer is that they are actually controlling your process of reading the book. They're setting the pace by where they place it, and they're guiding your eye through the page. Mm, yeah. um, they, they really are uh, making a major contribution to your reading experience. And if that's done in a slipshod fashion, it can really hurt your book. It can really hurt your book. So that's, uh, that's the piece of advice I would give is don't be afraid. To, so my letterers out there are going to love me for saying this. But don't <laughs> be afraid to pay, pay your letterers and take good care of them. And if you find a good one, then latch onto them, put a ball and chain around their leg and keep them. <laughs> well, I'm going to quit that course I started last week on lettering them. <laughs> that, that is very good, very good advice. Very good advice. Yeah. So, uh, well, we're, a bit, we're, we're an hour in. Where did the time go? Uh, exactly. uh, so, uh, so, guys, we love The Shepherd. So tell, tell the listeners, where can they buy The Shepherd right now? Okay. Um, they, of course, we're on Amazon. And I know we're on the Amazon UK as well. Uh, so that's easy enough if you want to get the hard copy. You can order it uh, in North America. We have Diamond, uh, which is the distributor for it. And they, uh, they have carried it. Uh, you'd have to have the order code, which is NOV151223. Um, we're also on a lot of digital platforms, Kindle, uh, drive Through Comics, Google Books, um, I'm forgetting. Oh, Comixology. You know, so there's a lot of different opportunities. And, of course, the Caliber Comics website, which I would recommend people uh, to check out. Uh, one of the things that drew us to Caliber in the first place is the incredible diversity of the genres of literature that they that they publish. Uh, they have war comics. They have zombie comic books. They have science fiction, supernatural um detective they have some really cool sherlock holmes stuff for people who love that uh, i know i do mm -hmm. um lots of different uh variety of different things that are that are out there uh j just take a look at the website and see for yourself uh, uh there's some really good books that are that are being published right now by caliber good stuff good stuff so if, if the if people want to read the shepherd this uh, basically just type it into google you're gonna find it yeah <laughs> definitely Excellent. definitely good stuff we cannot recommend the book highly enough and uh we will hope that you keep in touch and let us know when the next installment is available we will most definitely will we'll send it to you so you'll get Fantastic. a chance to read it even better <laughs> <laughs> you, you, do, you do love a freebie don't oh, you oh yeah and i'm <laughs> scottish you know and uh, so, i mean if you guys would like to come back on uh, when the when part two is available we are more than happy to have you guys back on Great, that'd be great. All right. Anytime, guys, anytime. One last thing I do want to ask. Obviously, yeah, the shepherd is, is taking up a big part of your time, and, and it, the second one is on the on coming on its way. Is there anything else that you may be working on, or is this just solely the shepherd right now? Barrow? Uh, well, uh, I am actually uh, basically 
writing the third uh, story arc right now for the Shepherd. Nice. Um, I'm on like I'm. I've basically written the entire rough draft. I am uh, about a scene away from finishing the first edit uh, of the third story arc. Uh, like I have like one scene left to go through, and then the first edit will be basically done. Right. Um, and it should be noted that he's that he's the primary writer. I'm all I'm doing on that is I'm his editor. Nice. That's it. That's he's, he, this is his this is his uh, baby all the way. Little bit of a reversal then. Absolutely, yeah. and that's what we've been doing is, nice. is giving him more uh, more to do with that. Uh, it's very exciting. I've I've read the first version of it, of course, uh, and I think it's it's got real promise. And he's I'm looking forward to the you know his uh, edits off that first version. So this will be his second the, the second version of the story that I'll be seeing in a few days. Excellent, mm-hmm. very good. Uh, and obviously, long term goals. How much would it take for you to sell to AMC? <laughs> <laughs> To sell it uh, as a, a uh, you're talking about like a, a TV series? Oh yes. I don't think that it belongs as a TV series. No. Like this is a like it's the kind of thing where like you know how we talked about whole the the whole issues yeah. thing and how it yeah. would work as individual issues. For the same reason that I don't think that uh, it would work as individual issues, I don't think that it would work as a TV show. Uh, this to me is uh, it would be like uh, we plan on doing solely graphic novels with this yeah. so like we're gonna release them you know one you know one full story at a time uh and basically they would be movies uh if they were ever if anything was ever going to be done in film with these things it would be movies well yeah let's put it this way if the amc comes to us uh i'm not going to sell out <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's sell out. That's but the I, answer I, I, I do understand for. what he's saying is that i think that you know you'd want something that would be um an environment where you could tell a longer story than a one hour, you know, uh, component of that. Um, Maybe something along the lines of what Netflix does uh, where they drop an entire season all at once. Nice. Um, That, that would work. I think very well. I'm a huge fan of the stuff that they're doing with daredevil, uh, Luke Cage, uh, Jessica Jones. Yeah, Um, I'm definitely looking forward to iron fist coming out. Uh, I, I think that's a great, way of exploring these characters and you have lots of room you know in a 13 hour uh, you know season like that that you can really do a lot of things that you can't do in a movie anyone from netflix is listening get it done <laughs> <laughs> right guys now right. that roberto has alienated amc which uh thanks for that, <laughs> appreciate that yeah okay whatever <laughs> maybe it's more of a cw type thing <laughs> there you go there you go Oh dear God! Uh, they come on three, six, five, flex, and we're causing arguments. I don't know. Exactly. That's what we like. Well, to I do. heard that's what you guys do best on the podcast. They were saying that you guys arguing uh, is what you guys do best. So, my God, you have listened get, to all the episodes. We get that a lot. Oh, yeah. we get that a lot. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't put yourself through too much of that, please. <laughs> <laughs> guys this has been an absolute pleasure speaking to you thank you very much uh, for, for taking the time to speak to us we love the book so much we want everybody who's listening to this episode to go out yeah, get definitely. yourself a copy of the shepherd definitely. you will not regret it uh thank you thank again you. for taking the time to speak to us we appreciate it and we will speak to you soon hey there kids Do you want to hear a show where a bunch of guys sit around in a comic book store and talk about comics and uh, lifestyle choices, uh, other goofy things and shenanigans they get up to? Then when have we ever talked about comics? Usually, it's people sitting on my lap and riding the struggle bus. That's true. It's mostly shenanigans, (laughs) Uh, but occasionally we talk about comics. And if you like any of those things, comics, shenanigans, Devin's lap, then you need to check out Snake Oil Comics with uh, me, Travis, and uh, my beautiful co host big def find us on itunes stitcher and snakeoilcomics.com so that was roberto and andrea yeah that was a cracking interview it was i really enjoyed speaking great couple of guys i did enjoy that it was was a good interview and i like i say like edited this pre pre ahead of time and 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 it's great and we did we did have a cheeky little technical difficulty well you know these things i'll tell you something I'll tell you something. Did you pull it out of the bag? Oh, I pulled it right out of the bag. I believe you. I literally, I just put like a sound effect going, in the middle, and, and you know, listen out. That's when you'll know when we had the technical difficulties. It just goes, you know, like when you're in a lift. Mm-hmm. It's just me going, <laughs>
I came up and recorded it earlier. I didn't. That's all bullshit. So, yeah, this has been Indie Talk. This is episode 60 of the 365 Flicks podcast. We will be recording episode 59 in a little bit. <laughs> I feel like I should be drunk having that conversation with you there. I'm all Just, about pulling back the curtains. Yeah. And, um, yeah, honestly, we have more Indie Talks on the way. We said way back at the start of the year, um, well, at the end of last year, we have so busy, we've got loads coming up. My the the next one is I'm really looking forward to our next uh, indie talk episode, and you know that I've I've been this the last few have kind of been your doing, yeah. But this one's been all me, and and I can't wait to speak to him, and it's going to be amazing. So yeah, indie talk is going to be getting a little bit stronger. Um, so yeah, do we just end it there? Yeah, end it there. Yeah. <laughs>